Eason, uh, Professor Julian, uh, he will talk with us about uh, um, latest in neuroprotection. Actually, this uh, lecture uh, we are waiting for because uh, we have um, uh, a, a, a cooling machine, total body cooling, in our uh, OB and Gynae Hospital and in our pediatric hospital. We are practicing uh, hypothermia and cooling around uh, seven years now. We have some publications in this field and actually we have also some problems <laughs> and uh, um, we are trying to improve our outcome. Uh, so maybe we'll f you will find a lot of questions after this lecture. Hello. Uh, well, uh, hello again. Uh, last talk before lunch, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be okay till then. Um, so, update on neuroprotection. Why am I talking about neuroprotection? Why am I talking about anything? Well, I suppose it's because I'm uh, uh, I'm a very interested. Uh, clinician and I run a unit I ran a unit in the UK that was a referral center for neuroprotection and then we've made the same uh, transition in uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, the Cornish hospital is also a referral center for neuroprotection um, after we undertook a great deal of uh, training uh, so I'm going to give you an idea of what's happening in neuroprotection where uh, where I think it's going what's currently happening how there are some different views about it um, and we can talk about those controversies too. I'll skip through where I'm from because you know that. So um, what about the world statistics? So if we look at some simple figures that we can all pull off the net, you've got 125 million live-born infants a year. 10, mil 10 million of those will have perinatal depression and f it's estimated that nearly half a million will die before they've had a diagnosis of, the ne of neonatal encephalopathy. Now, of the ones who are diagnosed with neonatal encephalopathy, we have various grades, one, two, and three, we, in various classifications, which we could, we'll talk a little bit about. But you can see a huge number of babies. And if you add uh, 287 uh, any, any deaths, plus those... Uh, um, uh, 430,000 that, uh, that die before a diagnosis, you're looking about 17, 717,000 deaths a year from neonatal encephalopathy. But what we're probably more interested in, maybe, um, it'd be lovely to prevent some of that, but if you look at the NE1, 2, and 3, of those 1.15 million babies here, there will be 430,000 with neurological impairment. So we're talking a, about a lot of babies around the world who definitely will have some form of encephalopathy. What's the definition? Well, a clinically defined syndrome of disturbed neurological function in the earliest days of life in an infant born at or beyond 35 weeks of gestation, manifested by a subnormal level of consciousness or seizures, and often accompanied by difficulty with initiating and maintaining res respiration and depression of tone and reflexes. So that's a fairly broad description of neonatal encephalopathy. But it actually doesn't specify any particular etiology because neonatal encephalopathy can be caused by many, many, many things. There are, over the years, there have been various task forces and various descriptions as to, as to what is neonatal encephalopathy and how best to, to compartmentalize it and describe it. And, or, or, and ordinarily, I think if we come back down to the 2014 task force, change the title to neonatal encephalopathy and, and, neurologi and neurological outcome, what they're saying is that there's an array of developmental outcomes that may arrive after encephalopathy in addition to cerebral palsy. And when the etiology is unknown, we use the word N-E, not H-I-E. 
because HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, is a very defined diagnosis. And not all our babies who are encephalopathic have HIE. And so we do often get some confusion. And therefore, when we're looking at ICD-9, ICD-10 coding, we have to be a bit more specific about what's, what we're talking about. So I'm going to be talking about uh, um, mostly uh, 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 HIE and so what is hypoxia what is uh, anoxia well you can have partial hypoxia or complete anoxia uh, and basically uh, a lack of oxygen supply uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the brain or blood hypoxia itself denotes a lack of oxygen in the blood Ano uh, partial hypoxia and anoxia is to the brain and the blood. So there is a little bit of a distinction there. Ischemia is a reduction, whether it be partial or cessation total, of the blood flow to an organ. Usually we're thinking about the brain, but of course we know other organs are involved. And that compromises both oxygen and substrate delivery, particularly in the brain, such as glucose to that tissue. Ooh, am I pressing here? So perinatal asphyxia, from the Greek word, uh, which means suffocation, is a decreased supply of oxygen to the fetus. You get hypoxemia and hypercapnia, anaerobic glycolysis leading to lactic acidosis, and eventually a fetal bradycardia leading to further ischemia of the organs. So a bit of a cascade. Now if we look at cases by region and gender in 2010, what we can see in various countries, high income Eastern Europe, Latin America, North Africa and the Middle East, but look at sub-Saharan Africa of the number of cases, okay, uh, and uh, uh, we're seeing a huge, a huge amount of, uh, um, amount of cases uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia compared to what we see in higher income countries. And this is where we are here, North Africa and Middle East, uh, where it is, it's, it's a, significant number of, uh, a significant number of cases are occurring uh, clearly, uh, clearly not as many as are around the world, which is where perhaps a lot of work needs to be done. But even in high-income countries, uh, 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 mainly in the mainly mainly in the West uh, Europe and uh, and the U.S., we're still seeing cases of of, of um, neonatal encephalopathy, of course, because it's never going to completely disappear. So what we can say, and from this study from Lorne in 2013, is unfortunately where you're born affects your outcome. In other words, if you're high income, mid income, low income, or low income home birth, then we're talking about a huge amount of, uh, uh, um, of, of patients with neonatal encephalopathy. So interestingly, the difference between home birth and facility birth does make a big difference even in the sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa because delivering in a facility gives you, a, gives you an edge. Having more money in your healthcare system gives you an edge. So we're going to talk about therapeutic hypothermia. Therapeutic hypothermia can be done in a number of ways. And the wonderful thing about neonatology is whatever we do and put into practice, we have to have very good reason to put that practice in. So we're ordinarily looking at a number needed to treat to prevent one adverse outcome in the, most of the studies that we've been looking at, um, uh, Cool Cap, Toby, is the number needed to treat is seven. Compare that with many, many adult interventions. For example, lovely, con lo nice controversy about taking a statin. About 80 or 90 people have to take a statin for one person to get a benefit. We wouldn't be cooling 80 or 90 babies to cure one. We have to have very high numbers needed to treat and that's why uh, uh, to, because uh, of the harm we could potentially cause by giving medication or giving treatments to just to try and prevent one, one adverse outcome. 
So when we get evidence in neonatology, it's usually strong evidence that makes us want to do something. And believe it or not, an NNT of seven is a very, very good number needed to treat. It's very few compared to many, many things that you take as an adult to think you, it's a benefit, whereas actually it may only be one in a hundred of you will benefit from a treatment or a drug. So NNTs are very important, and we use that a lot in neonatology. What's the mechanism of hypothermia? Hypothermia reduces cerebral metabolism, ATP consumption, and down-regulates many intracerebral metabolic processes. Essentially, it's putting the brain to sleep. So hypothermia, we know, has been used in other areas. We know if you're having cardiac transplants, patients are cooled. We know that patients who drown in cold water uh, do better than those who uh, from a resuscitation point of view, are, do better, far better than those who drown in warm water. Because if you're taken out after 30 minutes in cold water, and compared to being taken out after 30 minutes in, in warm water, your chances of survival are massively increased by uh, decreasing your overall body metabolism. So the cooled baby, the cooled person, anything that's cool decreases your metabolism and you can cope much better and much longer in that condition. So we've known this for a long time. So if we go back to those studies about the cool cap, the NICHD study and the TOBY study, and we're looking at infants with moderate and severe encephalopathy, we started to understand from these studies that basically the neurological outcome or babies with moderate encephalopathy and severe encephalopathy was reduced, perhaps not initially so much, a bit more equivocal and severe, but certainly in moderate encephalopathy, a very good statistically significant reduction in those infants who were suffering from encephalopathy. Therefore, is that, a, that has to be a good thing. We've probably tried, I, I was trying to remember, once a, here I go again, going back another 25, 30 years again, thinking about what we used to do. Before we knew this, in the 80s, I always remember babies who came out severely depressed. We always used to try and nurse them around 36 degrees because in those days we knew that overheating caused damage. What we didn't know, because we didn't have the studies, was that therapeutic hypothermia actually improved outcome. So I remember nursing babies that we were trying to predict were going to have some uh, a potential a brain injury. In, in the 80s, I was, we were nursing them at 36 degrees. We nursed them in open cots rather than closed cots because we knew for every degree above 37 you went, you, you worsened brain damage if there was going to be brain damage. So it wasn't really active cooling. It was kind of a bit of passive thought. And I remember doing that and actually, now I, now I understand that uh, perhaps what we were doing then wasn't a bad thing to do. But we used to worry about cooling our babies. Nowadays, of course, we don't ordinarily worry about cooling term babies. But we used to look at various markers. And those markers that we have, some people still hang on to because, and they say, oh, I, uh, um, you know, this is very important. But unfortunately, the acid base, we use it, we use it very uh, uh, widely on the, on the cord, um, and we, uh, we, use lactate, we use lactate a lot. Um, it, it's, it's okay, it's easily measured, but it's not brilliantly predictive. It can help. Your APGAR is quick but incredibly subjective, and unfortunately the APGAR score has proven not to be very helpful for many, many good reasons. And, un and that very interesting study is unfortunately probably less than helpful, in fact very harmful in some reasons for all those babies that got oxygen years ago um, and uh, were given 100% oxygen. Probably the APGAR score has caused far more damage than we realize. There's some very interesting paper coming out from Scandinavia about unfortunately what the APGAR score and 100% oxygen, the damage it's occurred to try and get us a good APGAR score. Uh, and so APGAR is still remains very subjective and unfortunately medico-legal. I worked in some countries where if I didn't put an APGAR score of nine at five minutes, the obstetrician would come and find me and say, excuse me, excuse me, the baby's APGAR was better than that. I don't want an APGAR of nine because I don't want anybody complaining about my practice. So 
what a joke is an APGAR score in some societies when you're not even allowed to reflect what's really happened because people are worried about litigation. That's a very strange thing. Clinically, we have the SARNAT scoring, which is subjective, but not a bad, not a bad uh, estimate. We have EEG, of course, and AEG, which ordinarily now is becoming the gold standard of early predictor of outcome. Ultrasound is clearly operator dependent. And the hardest thing I think you can ever do, and I te teach my juniors when we go into ultrasound and I send them on courses and they come back, the hardest thing to scan is a term baby's brain because interpretation is very difficult and the changes are very subtle. It's very easy to see an IVH. It's very easy to see hydrocephalus. A term baby with ischemia in the first few days is a very difficult scan to interpret. And many people go head scan normal. And it absolutely isn't. So you've got to be good at it. MRI and MRS, well, if you have that specialized equipment, we do look at MRI, but later on in the progression. And blood, well, there's not really any blood parameters, possi uh, possibly the lactate that is, that, is, that is helpful that's going to be used. So how do we assess a baby with neonatal encephalopathy? It can be all very exciting amongst all this equipment that somewhere in there there's a little baby or a, a, or a big baby probably that, 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 uh, that, that might have, uh, may or may not have neonatal encephalopathy. And so assessment is very important. Um, we tend, I tend to have followed the TOBI criteria for very easily putting into practice how we, uh, how we distinguish these babies. However, there, there still remains some confusion and, and some arguments by those who want everything to be absolutely precise to tell you exactly what to do with every baby. Once again, we're in the world of neonatology and nothing is black and white. So ordinarily, infants from 36 to 43 weeks with one of the following would fall into something called criteria A. So if your baby is, remains depressed at 10 minutes with a lowish APDAR score, subjective, you're continuing to resuscitate your baby for at least 10 minutes, you can time that. Your umbilical cord pH, now in some hospitals that's routine. Where I come from, every single baby has cord gases. No matter what's happening, it's just routine. That isn't routine in many hospitals. But if you have it, and you have a pH of uh, less than 7, or the baby's back on your unit or anywhere within 60 minutes, and you have a pH of less than 7, no matter where that blood is taken from, it can fall into criteria A. And then if you look at the base deficit of greater than 15, any gas within 16 minutes, not necessarily cord, capillary, or whatever, then you kind of think that something may have gone on with this infant. Now, of course, you will also know a bit of maternal history, baby history, and delivery history, which is making you worried in the first place. This isn't something you just look at every single baby and say, oh dear, do I need to think? There's usually something that's triggered you to start looking at whether a baby fulfills any of these criteria. And they are not absolute. You know, the doctor that comes to me and said, well, I, the pH was 7.02, so everything was fine, is really missing the point. These are guides, okay? They don't have to be exact. And to get that message across to some people I teach is very, very difficult. They want exact figures. And you said minus 15. It was minus 14.5. I don't care. That's still not a great basic set. Think a little bit laterally and continue your thoughts and investigations. But if you're falling into that criteria A, you then need to look at criteria B. And this is once again incredibly subjective because altered consciousness, hypotonia, abnormal reflexes. Well, that's just part of what may or may not be encephalopathy. Now, your baby can elicit these in the first hour or so of life. And I've had babies who've clearly been floppy and abnormal, who slowly recovered or two hours or so. And a consultant comes in and sees the baby at three hours and says, the baby's fine. I don't see any of this. And then, we don't need cooling. I'm happy. There's no criteria B. But the consultant didn't see this in the first three hours. 
and has completely ignored it. Because when they examined the baby, the baby was fine. But that's nonsense. If the baby has had some of this, then it's cause for concern. If it's fleeting, fine. But if a baby's got this for a period of time, then we need to take note of it. It shouldn't be summarily dismissed because when you, when you see the baby, the baby is normal now. Because the baby can still recover and gain its tone back but have had an insult. And therefore we have to be very careful. And the beauty of the Toby study, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to NICHD, is the use of the AEG, which has now come into standard practice when we're looking at therapeutic hypothermia. When I say that, not in every country, of course, but certainly, uh, certainly in the UK, Europe, and where we are in, in the UAE, we are using AEEG looking for that abnormal trace. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So, severity of encephalopathy, mild, moderate, or severe. I think we all know uh, um, whether we can look at level of consciousness, activity, posture, tone, suck, moro, pupils, heart rate. We can all roughly work out where we think a baby might be. But if you pop in an AEEG and you see abnormality, it's almost the decision is made for you that if you were working out whether a baby was mild or moderate and you weren't quite sure whether a baby was falling into a category for, for, for cooling or not, then if you've got an abnormal AEG, which we put on pretty quickly, then that helps you straight away to say, yes, let's cool this baby. However, I would also argue that that decision is, is usually made before, uh, before that because most of us would start passively cooling a baby at the slightest suspicion on the resuscitator. And so our team are, to are told to turn off the heater if I've got a baby who's being born with an abruption, an APH, a pathological CTG, very quickly, and the baby's turned very quickly, that heater is not going to be on, on the resuscitator, simply because the beauty of therapeutic hypothermia is there's no evidence of it causing any harm. So if you get it wrong, you can always rewarm a baby. But if you get it, if you get it, if 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 you get it wrong, that doesn't matter. But if you don't cool a but start to cool a baby, and you should have, you've missed a window. And um, that window of opportunity we'll talk about because it is quite important. So we've talked about our AEEG looking at background activity, possible seizures, knowing about anticonvulsant effectiveness and predicting outcome. It is a predictor of outcome and that's why it has been very, very useful for us to use. This is an old Olympic machine with a single trace and as you can see you have your, 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 uh, your, measuring, your measuring here either side of the brain with a neutral, uh, a neutral um, earth here as it were so that you're monitoring between two hemispheres single trace we do not use stickies stickies are pretty useless we use the needle we put the needle uh, intradermally under the skin uh, the stickies fall off all the time they're useless it may be okay for this one because this one could go on the shoulder the chest or whatever but really to, to get really good trace you, the stickies don't work you've got hair you've got you've got uh, meconium, you've got all sorts of things. They don't work. So a picture, I'm showing you this picture because that's exactly what we don't do. If we're going put to it, put it in, we use, uh, we use needles. And I showed you this earlier, so I'll whiz through it because that's a lovely normal trace. That's a moderately a normal trace, which already tells me I have a problem. Um, and that tells me I have a big problem. And you can look in various journals uh, uh, and begin to learn some of the traces. Only this one here is normal, moderately abnormal. All the bottom three are severely abnormal for varying different, different reasons. And pattern recognition is great when it comes to this. The cranial ultrasound, as I said, I believe is hard. That may be, that may be me uh, being a bit picky. Um, but I, I go on a number of courses and I, and I, and I teach cranial ultrasound um, and I always defer to the experts as I'm not a radiologist of course um, and I would always defer to an expert but when you do babies every single day you get reasonably good at it 
and, and, and many of my doctors fail to pick up what's happening in the thalamus, fail to happen in what's, uh, what's happening in the posterior limb and the internal capsule, fail to see the gray-white differential, fail to see the degree of cerebral edema. They're not the easiest scans to do. And, uh, and this scan, actually, believe it or not, is, a, is, ab is abnormal. There's a different, the reflectivity is, is abnormal. There's a blurring of, uh, of, of gray-white of gray differentiation. And so we tend to MRI our babies much later on, usually around 10 days or so. But early on, we have ultrasound. And early MRI really isn't helpful at all. So we use our very, very simple cranial ultrasound. But hard to interpret. You've got to, be, you've got to know what you're looking at. And of course we look at the resistivity index and you can look at the flow and we look at the diastolic flow that's occurring in the brain. And initially the resistance is high and then after two or three days the resistance dramatically drops. And you can measure the RI and very, very good sign of how much cerebral edema you had and what the brain flow is. And you know from the RI that your baby has also uh, 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 got some problems with blood flow. So actually an, ult an, ultrasound, an ultrasound looking at simply looking at the anterior cerebral artery with a Doppler, if you can understand it, is very, 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 very helpful indeed. So what about therapeutic hypothermia? Why? Well, we know that cell death after ischemia evolves over days and, and hours. And we know that it can be interrupted. And we know from older studies that on animal data that if you cool, start to cool tissue, then the energy failure that's occurring begins to slow down and can actually sometimes stop. So cooling seems to stop ongoing damage. This is a little bit complex, but basically looking at the effect of therapeutic hypothermia on brain energy failure. And really, as I think many of you know, uh, we're looking at the uh, phosphate. This is nucleified, uh, 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 nucleoside triphosphate to the exchangeable phosphate, uh, phosphate pool. When you have an insult, that ratio dramatically decreases, goes back to normal for a while, and then becomes problematical as brain damage occurs and ongoing damage occurs. But if you cool a baby, you can show that you can preserve that ratio. Similar to the lactate and acetyl aspartate, you can see a dramatic rise in that ratio. But if you cool a baby, you keep those levels of lactate down. If you don't cool, those lactate levels go, uh, continue to rise. So you can measure experimentally the damage and the process that's occurring in the brain and how you can interrupt it with cooling, which has to be good. So how did we start cooling? Well, cooling actually started a long time ago in the 1950s when there were studies done, uh, done on primates and then uh, uh, later on in rats and pigs and a lot of studies done in New Zealand by Gunn in, in, uh, in, in the sheep. And really we started looking at cooling in, um, in 2005 when these studies were coming to the fore and we all started to begin therapeutic hypothermia. And in 2010 the nice, nice guidelines and the nice comments were this is now routine standard practice in neonatal care. So that's in 2010, comment from, from NICE in the, in the UK, that this is fully accepted normal care for babies. And every baby from 2010 in the UK had to have access to a unit that undertook therapeutic hypothermia. That was a right given to um, the people and the children. What's been interesting is how have we cooled? There's been various ways. I show the body wrapping because actually head cooling is a bit of a nightmare. Head cooling is fiddly, it's difficult. Most people don't head cool unless they've bought a head cooling machine. It's far harder to nurse a baby. There's no benefit of head cooling. It's more expensive, it's more difficult. So most people just do a simple body wrap. It's very, very easy and you cool the whole baby. And that's, that's the commonest way to cool a baby. There are different types of mattresses and cooling wraps that you can get, of course. But, uh, uh, but it's, it, it's very simple to sort out. Now, the idea 
is that as soon as you have a problem, you need to start cooling get the baby down to somewhere between 33 and 34 degrees and maintain that for 72 hours and then warm slowly. Now we know, uh, let me just check that's not on the next slide. No, good. We know um, that the sooner you cool, the better. So everybody talks about six hours. So let me tell you why the original protocols were six hours. It's simply because physicians were given six hours to consent. The animal data shows that the sheep cooled at one hour, does better than the hypoxic sheep cooled at two hours, does better than the one cooled at four hours, and does better than one cooled at six hours. You don't wait six hours. You cool as soon as you can stop that inflammatory cascade. Which is why we turn off the resuscitator, to turn off the heater in the operating theatre or in the delivery room, because we do not want that baby to be warm. And certainly overwarming causes damage, we know that. And then we cool and we try and maintain between 33, uh, 33 and 34 for that 72 hour period. And then we rewarm slowly, usually about half a degree an hour, back to the norm. And that is a fairly standard protocol that you would use. Now, instigating or st the initiation of cooling is the decision that you have to make. But what I can tell you, and I would want to enthuse everybody is about, is if somebody or yourself or a senior or your colleagues or you agree later on that this baby didn't really need cooling, there's no evidence that you've caused any harm. And babies can be rewarmed. And babies don't have to undergo the whole process. If you think, well, I did it as a precaution, I was worried the baby, but actually this baby is now absolutely fine, eliciting no concerns, and had a normal AEG for six hours, it's very, 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 very acceptable to stop the cooling process. And that's fine. You were just being cautious. So, can we do any better? Why three days? Why 72 hours? And why 32 to 34 degrees? There was an NIH-funded trial looking at over 700 infants, looking at was cooling for longer better? Because if a little bit of cooling's good, a lot of cooling's got to be better. They also looked at basically uh, um, 32 degrees for 72. Why not? A lower temperature. Why 33 and a half? Let's go, let's have a look at these babies and let's cool some for longer and let's cool some more. Let's cool some for various times and let's have a look. How interesting would that be? What's fascinating is that the optimizing this longer, deeper cooling gave us fascinating results. The trial was stopped because in hospital mortality, if you were at 32 degrees, doubled. In hospital mortality, if you cooled for longer, doubled. And if you cooled for longer and cooler, it still doubled. In other words, colder isn't better. 33 and a half is fine. Longer isn't better. 72 hours is fine. So don't think a colder and longer cooling is going to do us any better because at the moment the study, there is no evidence and the, the animal data seems to be very correct that we've got it right at about 72 hours and about 33 to 34 degrees. So it has been looked at and that's what we need to do. So this was the study. In the longer cooling babies, more anuria, arrhythmia, longer hospital stays and in the deeper cooling, more use of nitric, ECMO, more days in oxygen and bradycardia. There were a lot more problems in these babies by trying to think, by trying to help them with a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, uh, cooling. This was another study, is duper cooling better? Brain cell death is reduced by cooling by three and a half, but increased with cooling by eight and a half degrees in the piglet. This was another study that, and in, in, in the piglet, which just showed that it's worse to cool more. So we've got the temperature right. So I don't think we need to ask that question anymore. C 
cooling to 33 and a half degrees in neonatal encephalopathy increases survival without impairments by childhood by 15%. I'm running out of battery. Uh, we'll get our IT man onto that. He can plug me in, I think. Can you see? So, the numbers needed to treat, as we said, were six to seven, which is great because that's not many babies. But 25 of moderate to severe neonatal encephalopathy babies will still die. Of course they will. This isn't a cure-all. And 20% of survivors will have sensory, motor, and cognitive defects. Of course they will. They've had brain damage. This isn't a cure. This is a, re a reduction of that inflammatory cascade. So, uh, Nikki Robertson, who's a wonderful neonatologist at University College London, very heavily involved in, in uh, a lot of these trials, which therapy to best augment cooling? Because we think we've done it. We've, we know exactly what to do. Cooling to me is easy. But can we do even better? Because we's not, we're not curing every baby. You may have heard of melatonin, EPO, and astalcysteine, allopurinol, xenon. There are other people doing other studies to say, can we get these babies even better? Well, the answer is, is interesting in that I would say possibly. So noble gases, the noble gases, the xenon trial has been completed. Uh, and I uh, saw the xenon trial. Um, uh, once again in, in Bristol in the UK where that was being done and in another centre uh, of in uh, London. It was both in, one in London, one in Bristol with the Xenon trials. Argon trial, there were some preclinical studies. So noble gases are felt to have uh, some, some uh, protection to the brain. Um, there's some re remote ischemic post conditioning. These, these are looking at therapeutic window studies. We know we've got the timing right. Melatonin is, is, is a fascinating drug that we know has various effects on the brain and the brain rhythms uh, and therefore that has been looked at. EPO, there are some studies and allopurina, there's an albino, uh, albino study in Europe which is ongoing, there's no results yet. So actually perhaps there's more than therapeutic hypothermia. Xenon and argon are noble, are noble gases. As I say, the, the, um, one of the reasons they're, they're their use is their mechanism of action is thought to be this is thought to be a GABA agonist so increasing inhibition and this is this is working on NMDA signaling uh, in the membrane so they work in different ways but it, but essentially uh, uh, reducing the inflammatory cascade and effect in the in the in the neurons um, the uh, xenon as I say these are very very expensive gases and that's why it's not routinely been taken up they're interesting studies. They look helpful. I'm not, argon is a little bit cheaper and a bit, more, uh, a, bit more, a bit more abundant, but xenon has to be recycled, re-scavenged, because these are very expensive gases and ordinarily not going to be used, uh, but they were very interestingly uh, uh, possibly do so, show some ben benefit. There'll be some more data on argon coming. Xenon has shown to be equivalent or perhaps a little bit beneficial, but it is so expensive and so fiddly to use that both the machines that used Xenon in the ventilatory circuit were built by independent research scientists, one in Bristol, one in London, both completely different. None are manufactured, none you can buy, so it's not really going to come anywhere. It was very, very interesting from a research point of view. Um, argon, of course, is everywhere, so this may, may be interesting. Um, so. Uh, the th problem with uh, xenon, it's, it's, it's 30 pound a litre. You imagine how many litres a, liters a minute go into a baby breathing and you want to put, you want to put xenon. We're, we're talking thousands and thousands of pounds just for one baby to get gas into a circuit that you then don't want it to lose as it exhales, so you scavenge it to try and, try and keep it. So it's a specialist ventilator. Um, the reason it's expensive is because <laughs> It's only 0.004% of the atmosphere that we breathe, and therefore it's pretty hard to concentrate. Um, so uh, this, was, this was the study. They, they, they basically got 92 infants. 
um, a mean age of starting was the problem. Because these infants were shipped in, consented, and put into the xenon study, they couldn't get these babies cool before 10 hours. Only 15%. So the study really didn't show any benefit, probably because they weren't cooled quick enough. So to get your baby to a center that had xenon, simply from a distance point of view, was causing a problem. So really it's a non-starter, because not everybody can have xenon. Very, very few. Only two in the whole UK had xenon. You just can't get a baby there cooled and on xenon within the hour. So, so problematical. Argon delivery, they're also, SLE have been very good about uh, adapting their ventilators to argon and... Uh, it is quite complex, so I don't think anytime soon you're going to see argon. Uh, I won't go into the detail there. Melatonin is interesting in the way, uh, the way it uh, works on the brain, and I think the melatonin studies are, are probably the most favourable um, in, in that. Uh, and, uh, when we look, when we look at its uh, mode of actions there uh, and how it works in the animal kingdom, and because there are diurnal var variations of putting the brain to sleep, the, uh, the thought of putting the brain to sleep with melatonin may also decrease uh, decrease its activity, and therefore. Um, and we know we have age variations in melatonin um, and in experimental stroke in adults. Some of you may know more about this. There, is some, uh, there, there are some reviews that if you give melatonin in stroke, uh, then, then there is suggestion that there are improved outcomes. And so there, me, therefore maybe it has a neuroprotective effect. Um, and ordinarily this, this, can, this can be shown in a number of, in a number of studies. So... Um, the, it's felt that it's trying to work out the dose is, is the hard thing, is what dose do you give? And, and people are looking, at, are looking at various doses to try and get the maximum efficacy effect in the adult. And therefore, it's very difficult to know what sort of dose to give in a, chi in a child or a baby when we don't really know the adult dose. Um, EPO, EPO is thought to improve cell survival and therefore can help with brain repair. So there are some studies ongoing with EPO. We don't have the, all the results yet. All the results yet. There have been some very early small studies where their babies are being enrolled and people are looking at, and it may be something that you hear about in the future uh, as to what we do. The albino trial is allopurinol. European centers over four years given immediately after birth with, with cooling, thought to reduce free radical production and a free radical scavenger. Um, so watch this space. Allopurinol may be something that comes in the future. So really, the future is probably going to be drugs and ice. Uh, we cool our babies, and maybe there's going to be some drugs that, that help our babies. So what can we say? My vision, or uh, and Nikki's vision, and a number of people's vision on how neuroprotection will evolve we basically, we cool our babies as soon as we can. We're still looking at noble gases and maybe argon will help early on, I don't know. But melatonin may well be added in. EPO takes some time to work and is, is looking at being added in later. So it may be that as an adjunct to cooling, we have other things to help our babies in the future. But none of them definitely yet. So MRI is the marker. Uh, um, we know that the, the biomarker uh, for very good after therapeutic hypothermia is, is quite predictive of outcome. Um, and we rely on our neuroradiologists to tell us what sort of damage can be seen in these infants and hopefully try and help the parents. But we, knew, we do know that it's very difficult to say, predict how, how a child's going to be simply by looking at a scan. We all know so they come into our clinics in various different conditions. But motor deficits are really relatively, relatively common, far more, far more than psychomotor. Um, so 
uh, you can work out, there are MRI scores trying to predict outcome, looking at positive predictive values for various patterns on the MRI. So you can read a number of papers to try and say how can you predict how well a child is going to do. It's difficult, it's not easy. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, I'm any good at that, except that if we see difficulties in an MRI, we're going to assume a baby is going to have some sort of problems. Um, therefore, I leave it to the experts to look at that. There are various scores, brain injury scores, uh, normal, M normal MRI, and then, we, then when we start to see and then we start to see damage in certain areas. There are various scores uh, depending on where you have your damage and whether you have any other cerebral lesions that are supposedly better predictors of outcome. Uh, these, are, these are something that I, as I say, I leave to the experts uh, uh, and, and they will, I can see a lot of uh, uh, areas here, echogenicity, posterior limbs, internal capsule, where you see the damage um, then we try and predict what a child's going to be like. But uh, <clears throat> that has varying, varying success. So what I think with therapeutic hypothermia is I think we know how to do it. I think we know when to do it. <clears throat> I think if we do it and we didn't need to do it, it's not a problem. But if we do it late, I do worry about litigation in this area. When every baby in the country that I originally came from has a right to therapeutic hypothermia should it warrant it. If somebody makes a mistake and it doesn't get it, then the parents have a right to say, why didn't you call my baby? Uh, and that certainly has occurred in, in, a, in, a number of, uh, in a number of places. And it's certainly in occurring in Abu Dhabi right now. Parents seem to be well versed about it and want to know why they're not being offered that sort of treatment. And they're also getting wise to the fact that you cool quickly. So as physicians, we can't really have parents being ahead of the game with us. We need to know what we're doing and we need to be very precise in what we're doing. For me, this is something, an area we can do a lot of good. I think we re there is a lot of evidence that we can help. And if we get it wrong, we actually don't cause any harm. Very, very minor, minimal side effects with therapeutic hypothermia that are not life-threatening. So, um, and maybe we'll be using it in the future with some adjuncts. I think it's exciting. We'll just have to watch this space. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Jerem, for this a very excellent presentation for a very tough subject. Now we can open discussion for a few minutes. Ten minutes. I'm nearly, I'm nearly ready for lunch. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? So, any questions myself or Greg? Dr. Eaton, thank you very much for the excellent lecture. I want to ask, sometimes we receive uh, hypoxic babies beyond uh, six hours of age. What's our limit beyond which I shouldn't even try to um, use hypothermia? Yeah, very good question. The animal data suggests up to eight hours. We will cool at eight hours. We are 10 hours. The evidence is, is you've, you have missed the boat. So there is some benefit after six hours. There is some benefit in the animal data. So we tend to after eight hours. If you... Brilliant. If... <laughs> still there? If you... Uh, the, uh, if you said to me, would you be wrong at doing it at 10 hours, do you know what? Because it causes no harm, um, and can sometimes in the world I live in prevent a lot of arguments and anxiety, I might well do at 10 hours. I, I, I could be persuaded, depending on the circumstances. But, but the evidence is you need to do it within minutes. 30 minutes on that resuscitaire. So six hours is what we say, because six hours was the consent for the window and the best improvement in the animal data. There was still some improvement up to eight hours, possibly a little bit beyond. So if you cooled, I wouldn't criticize you. Uh, I'd like to ask about the management of subtle convulsions. Do you manage? 
because there are controversies about uh, management of Say subtle convulsions. Subtle convulsions. Subtle convulsions. Yes. Ah, do we, what you mean? What do we do? Do you manage? No. No. Thank you. No, we watch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, we don't have a consensus for the anti-epileptic drugs in the neonatology, at least. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, we need a message to all of us. Don't discharge a baby on phenobarbitone. Once discharged, the, uh, the baby will continue on it. And this will be a problem in the new development. So, if you are going to discharge, and if he will be on long term anti epileptic, it's better to stop the phenobarbitone and refer to another. Levitiracetam is better in the Arab countries because of the high incidence of consanguinity. Uh, it's better than the um, uh, topiramid because we uh, have hot weather. Uh, there is no water regulation. So it's better to be avoided in our countries, the topiramid. Levitiracetam is better because we have a high incidence of consanguinity with high incidence of neurometabolic diseases, high... Uh, um, Ammonia and the pediatrician usually write phenobarbitone. So it's better to discharge on tyratem or levitiracetam than discharging on phenobarbitone or valborate. I, I, I would completely agree. I completely agree. And, and I was very, very keen to say don't discharge a baby on phenobarbitone. I, I, I just don't agree with it. Um, and you're right. So I would rather a baby went in the community, had a seizure went to see the pediatric neurologist and the neurologist then restarted on the medication of their choice. Uh, I could only say that since I've been introduced to the use of Keppra in the neonatal world, of which there's not a great deal of science and evidence to say that's what we should be using, it does work. And so I'm very happy with the use of Keppra now simply because I've seen it. But if I read the literature, I haven't got a great deal to guide me, but I agree it's been, uh, it's been a very useful medication. We are using it for 10 years now and without nearly side effects. Great. I think then you're, you're certainly way ahead of us than we were in, in the UK. Do you, do you feed the baby on, uh, with schooling? I'm sorry? Feed, do you feed him just even uh, traffic? I like that question. Um, ordinarily, on, on day one to two, uh, we are not feeding these babies. They're term babies with a mature gut. They ordinarily um, aren't going to run into the problems of lack of, lack of trophic feeding that a, that a preterm baby would. There are some concerns about whether the baby can tolerate milk. I would say our practice is that on day three or day four, when a, or when a baby's about to be rewarmed, if we have mother's milk, we will put in five mils Q3, which is our trophic feed in a term infant. So routinely do we feed? No. Will I start a dr med uh, milk day three, day four? Usually, yes. If I have a baby who's so sick with pulmonary hypertension, on the nitric, in a dreadful state, I probably wouldn't. Um, uh, so I, th I have done, I used to, before, I would still give a baby a bit of trophic feed. I've tended not to for about three days. But uh, I, uh, so ordinarily the answer is no, I don't. Towards the end of cooling, when, a ba when I think a baby's recovering, yes, I tend to. But, uh, but not feed, just trophic. All right, quick question. A question for you. So um, one technology I think is a little bit immature, but it pertains especially to infants with uh, hypoxic ischemic uh, injury to the brain is uh, NEARS. So measuring the cerebral regional oxygen saturation via a little probe that you put up there. Um, I guess it's, uh, my experience is we haven't used it a whole lot, um, but what are your thoughts about its potential application or experience thus far? Uh, I didn't want to particularly talk about NIRS because I don't know whether there's a talk on it or whether, so, or whether uh, uh, some people are, are very keen that we use neonatal infrared spectroscopy in these infants. 
my understanding of the research and the evidence so far is that it's very interesting, but I don't know how it guides my care. So it's an interesting number to see, but if I have a little bit of oxygenation that's less here, one, what does it mean, and two, what am I meant to do about it when everything else looks great? And so at the moment for me, NIRS is something that is still being investigated. I regard it as a research tool. I don't use it in regular practice and I, talking to the, neuro, the societies in London and talking to the real experts who know far more than me, they are telling me it is still a research tool and it, it's not going to guide my care definitively. And until it does, I need to spend my money on other things than buying a piece of kit that I'm not sure is, it's a pretty nice tool and it gives us lovely numbers, but I'm not sure how it helps my practice at the moment. Maybe I need to read more, but my understanding is it isn't going to change anything I do at the moment. So, no, but watch this space. Yeah. Was that the right answer for a researcher? Uh, yeah, I, I think I approach it with a, a, a lot of skepticism. And number one, from a technology standpoint, so it's basically, I mean, it uses light, right, to detect oxygenation in the brain, but you can't detect it in the brain because the skull is in the way. So really this little probe puts here, you just measure the, the surface, the tissue, oxygenation, saturation, and the assumption you have to make is that the, the oxygen saturation here is reflective of what's going on in the brain. And I think there's some important questions open-ended at this point, so I, I, uh, I more than agree. And that's why I didn't see it in a single slide. You didn't. <laughs> Think about it and tell us next time. Yeah. Would you please want to ask two questions? Uh, the first one about uh, using uh, the cooling. Many people are talking now about uh, using uh, um, cooling, uh, cooling in preterm babies. Now many people are talking about this. And uh, another question, please. Uh, others talking about taking when taking a cord uh, BGA, we have to talk um, about 20 centimeter um, uh, sample from the cord and, to and talking, taking two samples. Is it right? And we have to take two samples to, uh, for the BGA, for cord BGA. And is it? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, um, we, just, we just take one sample. I mean, there's, there's the old story of the cord and the cord But ordinarily, no, we just, we just, take, we just take one sample. I think we are running out of time and we have uh, more time to ask about neuroprotection in the workshop. Okay? Uh, now we can have lunch, but uh, please. Uh,